thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm Tom, and I can, I'll be talking tonight about the development of these holographic particle detectors that we've been working on over the past couple of years. Um, so essentially, these are devices that we've developed that can measure microscopic particles in the air um, inside of 3D images. And so there's a few things that we've tried to use this for. Um, primarily, we've targeted cloud particles, so the ice crystals and the water droplets that are made up inside of the clouds. Um, so we can do this by actually launching these instruments on weather balloons and flying them up and then sampling directly inside. Um, so I'll talk a bit about one of the balloon launches that we did, which was in fact a world first launch for an instrument of this kind. Um, but another application that we're also looking at is in the real time monitoring of pollen particles in, in the air. Um, and this is an important thing for hay fever sufferers, but it also can become a life or death situation as these so-called epidemic thunderstorm asthma out outbreak events can occur. So th th there's a few reasons why we'd actually want to be measuring these tiny particles, um, and I'll just go through um, what we've done. So if there's any questions, just stop me along the way. There's, I think there's a risk with these sort of talks that they might get a bit technical and bog down in some details. So. Definitely just ask me if I can get a bit uh, away. <laughs> um, so first of all, just uh, have to acknowledge all the very clever people who've helped out with this work over the years. Um, so there's too many to name them individually, but just noting that their financial and logistic support, as well as their general discussions, has been very much appreciated. Um, and, and I should note that this is work that's come out of my PhD project, which I've just recently completed. Um, and the commercialization work for the pollen detector is in partnership with ATRAD, a local company. So we'll be talking about those results. So I'll give a bit of that overarching motivation as to why we want to actually do this work. Um, initially focusing on the cloud and precipitation particle detection, which is important for climate modeling. Um, I then drill into some of the applications where we've actually tested these instruments in the field, which is in a field campaign in the Snowy Mountains, um, measuring snowfall in clouds, as well as this world first balloon launch. Um, and then I'll finish up with our commercialization uh, work where we're trying to develop this automated pollen detector. So um, for the cloud side of things, we can start with that. Um, why do we actually want to measure these tiny little droplets and ice crystals inside of clouds? Um, well, one main motivation is that clouds have been identified as the largest source of uncertainty in climate and weather models. Um, and you can sort of see that in this uh, plot I've shown here, which is showing the difference between the modelled um, effect of clouds, whether they cause a heating or a cooling effect in the atmosphere, and the difference from that model from the actual observations of the clouds. And so whether it's the brighter colours or the darker colours, that's where basically the models are getting it wrong. Um, and this is because we fundamentally don't understand how these clouds are made up and, and the physics of their formation and evolution. And this is a particular problem in places like the Southern Ocean where the dynamics of the clouds are quite complicated. We have a lot of so-called supercooled liquid droplets which remain as liquid even though they're below freezing temperatures. Um, and this is not well measured because it's actually quite challenging to get aircraft to fly through the clouds in those regions or have ships going through them. So there's a real lack of observations of these fundamental processes because they are a bit hard to measure. Um, and with the supercooled liquid water, that, that's a sort of a secondary motivation for us. Um, this is something that you can find in most clouds to some degree, but in parts of the world you see it a lot more than others. And, if you fly an airplane through a cloud with supercooled liquid water droplets in it, it can quite quickly, uh, instantly freeze onto the wings of the aircraft, and that does not end well. Um, the aerodynamics of that situation are greatly compromised, and there have been a number of major incidents over the years due to that. So if we could actually forecast and predict which of those clouds is actually safe to fly through and which are not, that would also be a really great outcome for this work. So yeah, the one way to measure these microscopic properties of clouds is, is with aircraft. Um, so A, that presents a risk and a sampling bias as a result. You just can't fly through all the clouds you might want to. Uh, and B, it's incredibly expensive to do that. Um, as a result, there's only been minimal observation campaigns over the years of these properties. 
So what we want to do is actually develop a low-cost, um, lightweight sensor that we could fly on a weather balloon quite regularly, because all around the world these balloons are being launched by people like the Bureau of Meteorology. Um, and also that could be deployed on a network of towers, say on mountain sites, which are just high enough to pass the clouds. And this would massively increase the availability of these me measurements. Um, there we go. So just drilling down a bit more into this climate application, um, clouds have been identified as the largest source of climate modeling uncertainty. And this is represented by the parameter called the climate sensitivity. Um, and this is defined as the increase in the average global surface temperature due to a doubling of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere relative to pre-industrial levels. And so this is the main metric people will discuss when they're talking about the climate targets and the politics of it all. Um, but what's interesting is, um, with this climate sensitivity, um, due to that doubling of carbon dioxide, you can expect to get about one degrees of warming. That's quite well constrained. But when you include feedback processes, and this is primarily clouds into your models, that range of warming ranges from around one and a half degrees up to about 5.6 degrees Celsius of warming. And that is actually an enormous error bar range. Um, because you can do the, the projected outcomes for certain amounts of warming based on other models. And even for a half degree Celsius of increase in warming, um, I've sort of summarized in this top plot from some other work people have done, the change in the outcomes for things like biodiversity um, and weather patterns is massive with just half a degree of warming. And so this range of multiple degrees is actually far too large for us to make sensible predictions. We really need to drill down and reduce that error bar. And primarily, we can do that by better measuring the clouds, which cause that uncertainty. Um, the other way you can see this is to look at the projected models for sea level rises. Um, and so this is shown on the bottom images. So on the left is with a projection of four degrees of warming. The blue is where the sea level has actually risen above ground level. And the right image is just with two degrees of warming. So just with those extra degrees, a, a far greater large part of the land has actually been overcome. And this is something that could affect billions of people over a relatively short time scale. So it is worth trying to um, understand these clouds better. But beyond that, they're actually just incredible. Like The amount of complexity in these uh, clouds is really cool. So you can get all sorts of processes like volcanic lightning um, through to instability-driven clouds like the Kelvin Helmholtz style that you may have seen, um, interesting wave-type phenomena. Um, and it really just goes to show, I think, that it is always worth looking up when you're outside because this stuff is very beautiful. But the important thing is that they're actually very complicated. And so that's why we need to have better sensors to try and capture that complexity in our models. Um, so looking at the, that complexity again on the small scale, um, which is what we're actually interested in doing by measuring the ice crystals, um, it Im it's actually important to get the ice crystal properties right in our models. And this is shown in this plot here where I'm showing the net heating or warming effect of clouds in a climate model as a function of what shape you choose to model them as. And you can actually see that the clouds can go from a, having a net warming effect to having a net cooling effect just for example by changing the ice crystals from being hexagonal in shape to being irregular in shape. So even that slight change in their microphysical properties will completely change the predictions of what clouds actually end up doing for the global heat budget. So because there's so few of these measurements, because it's very expensive with aircraft, we hope to be able to do that much more regularly with our low cost in situ instruments. So, this complexity stems from the underlying physics. Um, it's not entirely complicated, but the complexity emerges due to the sheer uh, scale of these systems. You've got so many atoms inside of a cloud that all have to aggregate to form an ice crystal, and then these ice crystals have to aggregate and grow due to changes in the electric fields within the clouds, or the temperature fields and the relative humidity fields. As that snowflake might pass through the cloud and turbulently mix, it will have a completely different history and hence a completely different outcome. And that's sort of captured in this plot where if you look at the different temperature regimes and the different relative humidity regimes, you end up with actually quite different particles. So needle column-shaped particles might be preferred at certain temperature ranges. 
Whereas to get to the dendrites, which are the more beautiful ones, I guess, you have to actually have a fair amount of water vapor available. Um, and this is where massive complexity emerges over kilometer scale cloud systems. Um, and so these are, again, just highlighting that natural complexity that we have to be able to measure at the end of the day with our instruments. Um, these are all real ice crystals, and you have these plate-type uh, plate ice crystals through to the stellar dendrites um, and the column particles, which are all essentially coming from water in the atmosphere, but manifesting in very different ways. Um, and so this is a good demonstration of that, I think, if I can get it to play. Uh, okay, if, if we can just click on this video, it might start playing. Um, yeah. So this is an ice crystal being grown in a laboratory setting um, by a group at Caltech in, the, in, in America. Um, and so they can vary the conditions around this ice crystal as a function of time. So the temperature around it and the amount of moisture around it. And as they change those conditions, um, you can see the way the ice crystals grow actually changes as a result. So it started off with this more dendrite pattern, but it's, as they change the temperature, now it forms plates simply as branches of that underlying cloud seed. So I think that's a rather striking example of what's actually going on in these clouds, but in a much more controlled setting. Um, so how do we hope to be able to actually solve this problem? I'll just briefly go into the operating principle of the instruments that we've developed, and that's called digital holography. Um, so this is a wavefront sensing technique um, that allows us to measure both the amplitude and the phase of an electromagnetic wavefront. So in our case, what we do is to shine a laser beam onto these cloud particles inside of our sampling volume, and then we measure the interference pattern between the scattered light and, the, and an unscattered reference wavefront. And so it's in that interference pattern, which we record on our camera sensor, that we actually encode information about the amplitude and the phase of these um, wavefronts. And the important thing is getting that phase information. So with a conventional 2D camera that we're all used to, you only get the amplitude information. So you lose all information about the depth of where these particles are. But with our method, by keeping the phase, we can actually then reconstruct a 3D image of where those particles actually are. Using um, scalar diffraction theory, uh, we can do that on a computer quite quickly. Um, and then once we have our reconstructed 3D image, we can pull out the key observables that we need, such as the particle sizes, shapes, and their spatial distribution, as well as their counts. It's fundamental to know how many there are. Um, and we've developed algorithms to do this automatically. Um, and the key challenge at the moment is to be able to do that faster than we currently are. Um, so Tom, that's yes. Those simple formulas down the bottom there. Yeah, it is fundamentally. Um, you just <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is where it might get a bit technical. We don't have to worry about those. But... <laughs> Pardon? This is just a. Um, it's a convolution mathematically, but it's it's a doing a diffraction, um, so propagating a, a a wave field, and in this case, it's our light field propagated to three D depths. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> Suffice it to say, this is a well-understood theory, and we've applied it. <laughs> so this is something you may be more familiar with in the analog case. So where we do it digitally on a camera, um, you can actually do this process of holography on analog uh, slides, where you coat it in a chemical emulsion, expose it to light, then when you shine that laser light back onto this glass uh, coated slide, you'll actually project a 3D image into space in front of it. Um, so you may or may not have seen these before, but as you look at these holograms from different angles, you're able to actually see around the object because you've captured the 3D information. And it's for, for exactly the same reason. It's because we're actually keeping the phase of the wavefronts as well as just their amplitudes. So it's a, quite a remarkable tool. Um, but as with any scientific tool, we have to actually quantitatively understand what our limits are. And the big one for us is just the resolution of these instruments, because we're trying to measure cloud particles with sizes from just a couple of microns, micrometers, which uh, range in size all the way up to a few millimeters, um, if not centimeters, if you're worrying about big hail particles. And so this dynamic range of sizes is something we have to actually try and target. 
And so our resolution is primarily limited by the diffraction limit. Um, and so this scales with depth. And so further away particles from our sensor are going to be blurrier. But what we've been able to constrain with the theory, as well as our laboratory testing and field testing, is that we have a resolution for our instrument of about particles of three microns up to about three millimeters in size. Um, and so that is very well suited to measuring these cloud particles, as well as small rain droplets. Um, and even as it turns out, things like pollen particles, which I'll talk about later. Um, and so this is in a sampling volume defined by the spacing of the laser and the camera. So any particles that pass through there will be able to measure. And it's in sort of a pencil beam shape is our volume because it's the overlap of the laser beam between those two limits. Um, so this is one I won't go into much detail in. But again, we have tricks to automatically analyze these images. Um, so if you are familiar with convolutions, then this is how we do it in a 4D sense, basically. We use temporal information as well as um, spatial overlap of features to say, this is a particle that's passed through our volume, as opposed to this might be just a bit of dust or another droplet on the window of the instrument that's not actually part of our physical system. So yeah, that's one we've solved. But what we have to still solve, and what we'd like to definitely solve for the balloon application, is to do this algorithm in real time on faster computers. Because that way, currently, we actually have to retrieve our balloons when they land on the ground. But if we could do this analysis in real time on the balloon, we could then transmit our actual information we care about back to the ground and, risk, and actually lose the instrument because we've intended for them to be low cost. And so this is sort of the next step we need to solve. But I don't see that as a fundamental issue, especially with the rate that hardware is um, improving these days. Um, so here's just a few examples of what real data actually looks like. Um, so these are some holograms, which are not focused images yet, um, from our Snowy Mountains field campaign, where we were looking at cloud droplets. Um, so on the left, um, not, no, not really. I mean, the camera is actually inside of the cloud. And so given the geometry of it, the camera sensor might be about three millimeters in a square, so three millimeters. And the water droplets are on the order of, say, 20 micrometers. And so inside of that camera volume that you're seeing, you are actually seeing this sort of size for a particle. So when that comes to focus, that is essentially what their actual size and shape is. But you're quite right. With the human eye, um, I think we really struggle to, I mean, human hair, I think, has got a thickness of a few tens of microns. We might be able to catch that in the light, but it, much smaller than that. And I don't think we're going to be seeing it exactly. Um, but indeed, this is um, on the left a, a field observation. And so when I show this as a video, we'll actually see the 3D image. This is only an out of focus frame at the moment. But we'll hopefully be able to see this ice crystal coming into focus. Um, and so just to guide the eye, I've also done use our model of holographic system to actually simulate that same data. So if we look on the right image, it'll be a bit easier to focus on. Um, but essentially what we expect to see is a large particle coming into focus at a great depth in the 3D image. And there's actually a couple of tiny water droplets as well at closer depths. So I'll play the video. And as a function of time, it'll show subsequent depths in our reconstructed 3D image. And so we'll see those different particles, hopefully. OK, good. It does play. Um, this is always a challenge with this slide. I need to do a better one. It, there's a little droplet there. It's a bit hard to see, so I don't know that we'll actually be able to see the small droplets on the screen. But pay attention to the large column particle that does come into focus um, at the further depths. So now we have a sharp image there, as opposed to the out of focus. Uh, the droplet, there's one right there, if you happen to see it, yeah. is in focus. And then as they go out of focus, we can't see them. It's a pimple. It's a pimple, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But this is the remarkable thing. It's this complex shape here that does come into focus. And so this is now just the frame where that ice crystal is in focus. And in this case, it's a sort of a column particle with a bit of irregularity in its shape. So all I really want to emphasize there is we, we can measure these complicated shapes, as well as the more simple spherical water droplets that are common in both particles are common in clouds. 
Okay, um, so just noting that we've done extensive lab testing on these instruments and um, we use things like calibration microspheres. So you have particles where you absolutely know what size they are um, and then you just put them through your sampling volume and you can test that you're actually measuring what you think you're measuring. Um, as well as we've used these US Air Force resolution test targets. So these go all the way down to just a couple of microns in size up to a few millimeters. And so this gives us a great way to actually calibrate and validate our observations in the lab. Um, so what we found is we have confirmed the size range. We can measure particles from about three microns up to about three millimeters. Um, and indeed the automated analysis can actually handle these size ranges, which is important for us. Okay, so I left this a bit open as to what we might want to talk about. So I think I'll talk a little bit about the um, Snowy Mountains field campaign we did, but um, it might be a bit technical to go into too much detail. So, it's yeah, it is. Yeah, if you've ever. Well, the point is, it's in the Snowy Mountains, but it's one of the key sites for Snowy Hydro, where the power electric scheme is. So that was one of the motivators for doing this research. Um, snowfall is a key part of their system because it works out what, what actual water goes into their hydroelectricity, um, but actually being able to accurately measure snowfall remains quite a challenging problem, partly just because how do you say what snow has fallen from above and what small snow is actually just windblown snow on the surface? How do you actually try and disentangle that um, system? And so we proposed to try and do that by looking at their shape and size information. You might expect that a particle that's tumbling around on the ground might be more likely to be shattered and broken. If it was a pristine particle that's fallen only from the sky, it should have a more pristine shape on average. <coughs> Um, so this is a complicated problem for anyone to think about at the moment, but this is a way to try and better understand this with the other benefits of just testing out our instrument um, because these holographic observations are very rare at the moment. Um, so what we did was we deployed it at a tower site on a mountain in Cabramara, Snowy Mountains. So it's about 1,500 metres above sea level. Um, and so this is suitable for clouds to actually pass through our sampling volume as well as for snow particles and rain to actually fall through the system from above. And we deployed it alongside a range of gold standard existing instruments, so conventional 2D particle images um, as opposed to our 3D measurements, um, as well as remote sensing methods like LiDAR and radar. So we can actually try and build up a full understanding of these microphysical properties with this unique suite of instruments. Um, and indeed, this is unique for this part of the world especially. Um, so it was quite an interesting campaign to do. Um, so we deployed our holographic microscope. So this is one of the models that we've developed, shown here. So the laser sits in the smaller box, then it shines past the gap on, onto the instrument, onto the electronics in the larger box. So the camera's actually in this part, looking outwards. So any particles that pass through that sampling volume, then we can image in 3D um, from three microns up to three millimeters. Uh, we also deployed a polar sonde, which is another instrument we've developed in our group. So this is from my supervisor, uh, Murray Hamilton. Um, and what this instrument does is to actually shine out polarized light into the clouds and then measure the backscattered light coming back. And by looking at the polarization change, you can start to work out whether these particles are generally spherical in shape or have got more complicated shapes. Um, so this is not as, uh, I mean, our, our 3D images are much more high resolution observations, but in some ways they're harder measurements to take. And so in complement, these instruments are quite nice to go with each other. Um, otherwise, we deployed some standard instruments. So there's this PIP 2D imager. It only takes 2D slices of the field that it's looking at, but it can measure particles from about 100 microns up to six millimeters but it's not a quantitative tool. So whereas we can actually say what the sizes and the shapes of the particles are, this is more just a way to actually just see what their images look like. Um, likewise, we deployed a passable distrometer. So again, a standard instrument. This can measure particles from about 200 microns up to about 25 millimeters. So this actually goes to bigger particles than we can see. And so this is more targeting rain. And so in combination with our holographic observations, this gives us quite a nice coverage of all the particles that we'd expect to see. Um, that's the in situ side. And so we also deployed some remote sensing instruments. Um, and this includes a 95 gigahertz um, a cloud radar from the Bureau of Meteorology. So this has a high resolution due to its large frequency, high frequency, but 
It also has a significant amount of attenuation um, due to that high frequency, so it's not so suited for rain events, um, but it can give very high resolution uh, data for clouds. And this is in contrast to the micro rain radar from the Antarctic Division, who they supplied this one. So this has a lower frequency at 24 gigahertz, um, which means a lower resolution, but it's much better suited for rain measurements because it's much less attenuated. Um, and we also deployed a, um, a LIDAR, so this shoots optical light into the clouds. And so this is very good at discriminating spherical water droplets from ice crystals, but it is also very quickly attenuated in clouds. And, and so, so these instruments all have pros and cons, but by deploying them together, we can really get a unique understanding of the physics that's going on. Um, so this is just a summary of um, a, a snapshot of our holographic observations. Um, this is over 30 minutes in this case. Um, and so what we see in this image here is the 3D reconstructed uh, image over that time frame. So the particles are seen as the little dots throughout our entire sampling volume. Um, they're color coded by a metric that tries to describe their shape. Um, and what's good is that they're not uh, obviously clustered in space. So it tells us that our instrument is uh, sampling reliably, which is important. Um, and generally mostly small particles. So this is quite typical of a, a cloud of small water droplets. Um, this is consistent with um, what we're seeing in the size distribution in this plot. So a mean particle size of around 10 microns, which is not uncommon for clouds. And it agrees well with the theory of a typical gamma distribution. Um, so generally just encouraging to see that we're sampling reliably. Um, and so I think these slides probably get just a bit too technical for the time I have. We can possibly come back to them if we want, but I'll skip over these, I think. Uh, Tom? Yes. Um, you might have already explained it. Yes. But, uh, can your software authentically change? Can you look at uh, carbon particles in the atmosphere? That's a good question. Um, are you talking about, say, like soots and emissions from like diesel particles and these sort of, yeah. Yeah, it, what I should have probably prefaced with at the start is we're, we're very interested in other applications for this work that might come up. So these are sort of things we are interested in. Um, it really comes down to the specific application. So something like diesel are quite often a bit too small for our current instrument. You often tend to find that they might get up to about a micrometer in, in maximum size and they're often a few hundred nanometers. And so our resolution limit starts at around three micrometers. So it's very close at the moment, but it's not quite able to get those ones. Um, so with the next version of the instrument, I do have ideas for how we might actually be able to target them. So I don't think it's physically impossible, but straight off the bat, our current instrument, it wouldn't be able to see those extra tiny soots, I think. Okay, so yeah. Sort of yeah, yeah, I think it'd be a very interesting application because there's a lot of reason to actually try and monitor that better. <laughs> yeah, yeah good, good question. Um, so yeah, um, the goal for this work was to try and say, well, with our holographic observations, can we try and distinguish between different atmospheric weather events? Um, so whether it be a snowfall event versus a, um, a cloud event versus a rain event is the three that we wanted to try and compare. Um, so those previous slides were just ways of saying that with all of those instruments, we were able to co quite confidently say, well, which of these was snow, which was rain, and which was cloud? And so then in knowing that, we want to ask, can we work that out by only looking at the holographic observations? Is that enough? Because if it was, then that would make life a lot easier. We wouldn't have to deploy a million instruments. We could just step aside and say, this low-cost sensor can go out in the field and tell us some very useful things. And so that's the question we want to try and answer. Um, and so what do we have to work with? Well, one is the size measurements that we get in that 3D volume. And that's what I'm showing here for each of those different types of event. Um, so in the yellow, it's for a snowfall event, and so you see that there's a very large size distribution that actually extends all the way up to around 900 microns, so <laughs> I guess all the way on the wall there. Um, this is in very steep contrast to the August 3rd event in the green, which is for a cloud event, and so that has a very narrow size distribution, um, centered at around uh, roughly 20 microns, 15 microns, which is typical for a cloud. So quite different from that snowfall size distribution. And the rain event in the orange is actually kind of sits in between the two. So even just by looking at the sizes alone, there is some hope that we could actually tell you which, of, which is which based on just our holographic measurements. 
Um, we have some independent ver verification as to these events are actually occurring or not. So this August 7th from the webcam shows it's very cloudy and it's completely obscured um, in contrast to a clear day, of course. Um, in contrast to a snowfall event, we actually get a lot of streaking and um, spattering on the camera lenses. These are all clues uh, externally that different events are actually taking place. And so the other way that we could measure, try and classify these different events is to actually look at the images, the in-focus images of these particles and look at properties like their shape. Um, so these are a selection of images we took, for, we uh, measured for one of the rain events um, and you're seeing primarily spherical particles, so spherical water droplets, which is what we would expect, as well as the odd, uh, more complicated shaped larger particle and so this is more typical of little flurries of snow but primarily uh, water, water droplets in the rain. Um, and this is in direct contrast to one of the snowfall events where we have a wide selection of all sorts of interesting uh, ice crystals and snow particles with much more complicated shapes. Um, we've got a few needle-like particles, mostly irregular particles where we've got this complexity in their growth. Um, so there is really a clear distinction between this rain event and a snow event just by looking at their shape as well as their size properties. Um, so independently we can confirm this by looking at the, um, the 2D imager, the PIP. Um, so again, this doesn't give us the 3D information or quantitative information even, but it does broadly agree. We'd see these irregular shaped particles um, as well as the odd needle particle. So it does give us some independent verification. And in contrast, again, to the other type of event, which is a cloud event. Um, and again, we then expect to see spherical water droplets, but they're much smaller in size. Um, so it gives us a way to try and... Uh, that's a convention for UTC. So it's just the time in universal time. Yeah. Yeah, quite right. It stands for Zulu, doesn't it? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> but what it means is it's just UTC time. Yeah. Um, so that's from 9 to 4 p.m.? That's from 9 to 4 UTC, and so then you have to apply the time zone. So yeah, because this was... 9 9 from 9 to 1600, is that what it means? You have to add our time zone, so it's probably plus 9 hours roughly for the snowy mountains in Australia. So it's actually 9 plus 9. Oh, that's, so that's 9 to 16 in... Uh, UTC. Yes. Yeah, exactly, Greenwich, I guess, yeah, <coughs> Gren GMT. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's the same thing. <laughs> exactly right. Um, and again, these are a bit too technical. So what we can then finally try and say is looking at these holographic measurements of holographic counts on the top axis and holographic diameter on the bottom axis, we can form a scatter plot. And we can color code them by something that the radar can measure, which is the reflectivity. And so what you then see is you actually can try and cluster these different events in your parameter space to say which is which. So the X's um, show the snowfall event, and you can see that in the red circle, their sizes again go all the way out as well as to their number densities. So they sit in a large part of the parameter space. But it's a very different part of the parameter space where the triangles are, which is what we show for the, um, the cloud event. So it's an ability to discriminate between these events um, and what's a bit harder is discriminating a rain event because it does sit in between. But what we do see is that through their number density, there is potentially a good discrimination there. And also in their size, it has a much narrower cutoff region. Uh, it certainly doesn't extend out to the region where we might expect for snow. So preliminary results, but purely using these holographic observations, I think there's definitely scope to be able to say what sort of weather is actually going on in an automated way. Um, and we can compare this to the Bureau of Meteorology's uh, precipitation model, one of the ones that they're using at the moment. Um, so here I'm showing the holographic counts of particles that we measure in blue on this plot, uh, the passable rain monitor in red, um, and the Bureau of Meteorology's precipitation model is shown in the green. And so you can see that it is good that it's, it's actually said that there is rain going on during this event, but it has a significant offset as to the timing of this event. Um, it takes a while for the model to work out that something's going on. Um, and also the duration of the event is quite small compared to the time over which we actually measured there to be rain. 
So these sort of studies are one of the best ways to actually calibrate and validate these climate and weather models um, and using the direct measurements that we've actually taken from the field. So this is quite a useful application. Okay, so going on to one of the other applications, which is um, this balloon launch of one of our holographic microscopes. Um, this was done in Adelaide, um, and it's a, yeah, it's a world first for an instrument of this kind. So understandably, we had to completely redesign the instrument to be suited to that application. It has to be battery powered, and it has to be lightweight, so it can fly in a balloon, and it really has to be much more cost, it has to be cost effective, because there is a real risk that you will lose the instrument in something crazy like this. Um, it could easily end up over the ocean, and then that's not going to come back, or even just the damage of falling from um, nine kilometers into the atmosphere. It's quite an interesting engineering challenge, um, but we were actually able to succeed at that, so I'll discuss some of those results from that launch. Um, just a little bit on the design side of things. Um, to keep that weight down, we had to use things like 3D printing for a lot of the optical mounts, so where the laser and the camera end up sitting, um, as well as things like carbon fiber rods for spacing these uh, parts of our sensing system. Um, and where possible, we use things like polystyrene just to keep the overall weight down and protecting it from sunlight and water using aluminum um, foil around the box. So this is the, um, the final instrument then. Um, the internals, uh, oh, <laughs> we have our, um, our laser shining out of this smaller box, shining onto the camera in the bigger box and the control electronics. The important thing to note is the, um, the laser's in here, the camera's in here, and so our sampling volume is any particle that is passing through between those points as the instrument flies through the cloud on the balloon. Um, and yeah, you attach it to the balloon using the, the string. Um, so just a couple of uh, photos from the launch. Um, but the important thing to note is the payload train. So we have Murray's uh, polysond instrument at the bottom. Um, and this is quite close to the holographic microscope. So we want the microphysics measurements to be quite close so that they're sampling the same part of the cloud normally. Um, as we go up, we have a range of other standard meteorological sensors, so temperature and relative humidity, and we even got our hands on one of the standard Bureau of Meteorology radio sons that they use all around the world, so quite a trusted measurement. Um, as well as the logistical items, like the cut-down payload, so we can actually cut the balloon remotely and drive out and retrieve it, uh, the parachute, um, and yeah, just the things that you need to actually track that balloon in the air from the ground. Uh, yes, so those items. So we found a nice cloudy day. Um, we launched from Auburn, which is uh, sort of just north from Adelaide. Oh, yeah. Yeah, some of you would probably have been there, I expect. <laughs> it's a very nice place. So it was nice to just drive out that way for a bit. <laughs> um, but we launched um, from Auburn. Um, we reached an altitude of around nine kilometers into the atmosphere. Um, so that took us about an hour for the flight coming back up and down. So this is our trajectory of where the balloon actually ended up. And we used modeling to actually predict where the path of the balloon would go. And we did pick a day where it was likely to end up here <laughs> rather than here. Because we're not at the stage where we can, like I said, automatically transmit our data. We actually have to retrieve the instrument when it lands. Um, and also just noting, this is quite an interesting part of the world to actually do these sort of studies. Um, because we have, well, the seeds of clouds are aerosols, the nanometer scale particle, whether it be things like dust or uh, sulfuric acid in the atmosphere. And so we have a contribution of aerosols from the mainland, um, so things like desert dust. But we also have a significant contribution from the ocean. Um, so aerosols like sea salt, um, and perhaps more biogenic um, origins, and so this interesting mix of aerosol sources actually ends up with some rather interesting cloud properties. And so it's, even from that perspective, it was worth quite interesting. Um, so again, we can just look at some of our observations. Um, so this is, again, our 3D image of the cloud particles that we measure. In this case, it's during one minute during the launch. So we note that they're not uh, obviously biased in their sampling. And again, the size distributions are pretty sensible, um, centered around 12 microns for a water cloud. 
and indeed the temperature is above zero for this cloud, so it's quite consistent with this being a cloud of spherical water droplets. Um, so what I can show here now is to take those one minute snapshots of the microphysics properties and plot them as a function of height on the y-axis. Um, so I've got the number density of particles in blue, so how many particles there were per unit volume. Um, and what we see is there's actually multiple bands of cloud that we managed to measure during that launch, which is quite cool. So we've got a low level band of cloud up around one kilometer in altitude. Um, and we see the particle sizes in red increasing with height, which is an uh, interesting feature. Um, at this mid-level cloud, we have a more patchy band of cloud. Um, again, with uh, slightly smaller particles, but significant uh, number density to count them. Um, up to the very highest altitudes, where we have incredibly low number densities of particles, but what we'll see is much more interesting shapes. And so this is typical of a high-altitude cirrus cloud at around seven kilometers, roughly. Um, so independently, we can verify that we're actually in clouds. Um, so the red shaded region is where the, we had an external facing webcam on the balloon, so we could actually see out where we are. So the red shading is where that webcam was fully obscured by cloud, um, and that lines up well with where we measured the particles. And likewise, the relative humidity shown in green, uh, you can see it tends to increase when we're inside of the cloud bands. So this gives us an independent measure that we're actually inside of clouds. Um, so yeah, um, we can look at some of the shapes and sizes that we saw. So for that lowest band of clouds, the water band, the water droplet cloud, um, we see typically only spherical water droplets with a size of around 12 microns. Um, whereas when you go up to that next band of clouds, um, the sizes are significantly smaller with a mean size of around 8 microns. Um, and some indication that um, these may have some irregularly shaped particles. However, for this instrument, it was not quite, our resolution limit was not such that we could discriminate those very smallest in shape. But we can still reliably give them uh, size estimates. But we can tell that they have actually become smaller by that height. Um, we see a similar um, set of particles at the next band of cloud. Um, but the most interesting ones are during that cirrus cloud, um, up to around seven kilometers in altitude. So we see signs of uh, column-like particles, um, which are transparent, which is actually a very interesting ph phenomenon for a few reasons, as well as more standard column-shaped particles, as well as these more complex uh, aggregated particles where we have different sort of rosettes and, and wings forming on the side of them, um, and much larger sizes than any of the particles at the lower heights. Um, so what's interesting is to try and work out why there are these differences, um, and by comparing with models and different sensors, we've um, started to look into that. It's a unique measurement in that sense. Um, an easy thing to do is to just look at the size distributions from each of those band of clouds. Um, certainly we can see that there are differences in those histograms. Um, and looking at those sizes, we found them to be consistent with the very few aircraft measurements that have been done in nearby regions. But again, this is the fundamental problem. There's just very few measurements of this stuff at all. So it's, um, it's uh, definitely a motivation to try and do this more often. Uh, yes, that was a really interesting field campaign. I think that was in 2017. So that's the most recent big aircraft campaign that we've done. Um, and this was targeting measurements over the Southern Ocean. So people like many universities from America and their meteorological agencies came down to Hobart um, and a lot of participation from groups around Australia and other parts of the world. And they flew many aircraft into clouds on different tracks towards Antarctica and back. They also sailed uh, a number of vessels on the water, uh, so big ships that had plenty of instruments on them. Um, and of course, doing all the other things like doing balloon launches. And so this is a really dedicated field campaign to try and understand these southern ocean clouds, which I mentioned at the start are probably, well, they're certainly a very challenging problem to work on at the moment because they have this prevalence of the supercooled liquid water that is very hard to measure with conventional methods. So that was, yeah, a really interesting campaign. Yeah. Um, but, as you might expect, incredibly expensive as well. So <laughs> you can only do that in 2017. And I think the last one was, I won't 
try and claim a real date on that now, but I would expect it was at least five or ten years before then that the last one happened. And so there would be great potential in doing what we're doing where we could do these more regularly on weather balloons uh, in a cost-effective way. Um, so yeah, just noting that our measurements uh, are consistent with uh, the few that do exist in the literature for this sort of uh, type of cloud. Uh, and that's too technical, I think. So I think that's a good time to start talking about the final application, which is um, in our commercialization attempts, which is to try and measure pollen in an automated sense in the air. Um, so it turns out it's like these, these particles, uh, they're, they're actually quite a good size for what we're developing at the moment. So I'll get into what sort of sizes and shapes pollen are, but I should probably start with why we're actually interested in measuring pollen. Um, so there's probably two main reasons. You could call it a, a background reason. Um, many people in the world have pollen allergies and, 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 and asthma. Um, people, some people have estimated it as around roughly 30% of Europeans in various studies that found these numbers. Um, this has led to measurable economic impacts on the order of a few hundred billion dollars per year. Um, and these impacts are only expected to worsen due to changes due to climate change. Um, and so it is important that we actually try and monitor these events. Um, furthermore, we have quite transient reasons to be interested in measuring pollen. Um, so some of you might remember there was um, an epi the so-called ep epidemic thunderstorm asthma pollen outbreak in Melbourne. Um, this was back in 2016. Um, and overnight, for reasons that scientifically people are still very interested in trying to understand, um, there was a massive spike in the occurrence of people being admitted to hospitals. Um, there was around 10 deaths just overnight. Thousands of people suddenly being admitted to emergency departments. Um, and really, there was no warning or expectation as to why this would happen. Suddenly, Melbourne's healthcare system was completely shut down. And it turns out it was due to this pollen outbreak. Um, so the perfect storm, so to speak, of pollen conditions converging with a thunderstorm over the city, what they currently believe is the thunderstorm was able to actually break down the pollen particles into even tinier particles that can more easily get into the lungs and penetrate deeply. And then the downdrafts of that thunderstorm were perfect for distributing that into people's lungs. So this is a, um, a, a somewhat rare event, but it has occurred over the years. <clears throat> and when it does occur, it's an incredibly devastating thing. So we are not well placed at the moment to be able to forecast these. There was no forecasting for the last one. And it's primarily because the current technology for monitoring pollen is um, quite limited, I would say. Um, it, it, Such an amazing area. It's really fascinating, I think. And what's emerged from this is a lot of scientific interest on these problems. So many theories are coming out now, and people are trying to experimentally confirm this. But there's no clear answer, I think, on actually why. What I do think is one of the leading theories is that the conditions inside of the thunderstorm, the strong electric fields, the, the, the precursors to lightning, simply had enough energy alongside the water and the the ice crystals smashing these pollen particles together in energetic scenarios under a lot of turbulence. It's believed that physically that would be enough to break them, but people don't know, and they're starting to try and measure this in the lab now to see if that's actually a sensible theory or not. But they do believe that was an important part of it, getting those particles small enough that they can penetrate to the lungs through breakage. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, the current method to measure pollen is um, its kind of like a sticky tape. You, you put it out into, the, yeah, it's kind of curious. <laughs> you put it out into the field and the particles accumulate on that sticky tape. Um, at the end of the day, if, you, if you're lucky, you, someone can go out to that sensor. They can drive the sample back to the lab or, or fly it, if, depending on where it is. And with laborious, tedious labor, um, people with a manual 2D microscope can then scan that sticky tape and individually, humanly count the particles on that slide. 
So remarkably, this is technology from the 50s that is really still the prominent method for measuring pollen. And so understandably, this is not a method that can give you the hourly warning for these sort of transient rapid outbreaks that we actually need. And so this is a problem that really needs to be solved. And we're proposing to do it using our holographic technology. So putting these sensors out in the field, we can measure in real time the particles that go through it. We can try and use those properties of shape and size to classify the particles and then provide warnings of events such as this, as well as a far greater uh, understanding of the background term of how much pollen is in the air on a temporal time scale much shorter. Uh, so uh, it is worth mentioning that there are automated uh, sensors that do exist. Um, more recently, these have started to become developed as people have realized this is a real challenge. Um, but even these have their own limitations. And, and one of them is they, do, they are quite expensive. So um, this is an area where it pays to have a lot of sensors over a large area. Because not only do we have to measure the pollen where people live, in the cities. We have to measure the pollen where it's being produced in the source regions, so the, the grass fields and, and regions of trees and so on. And so you, really we need a large network of these sensors and it, that is therefore essential that these sensors can be low cost, such as the ones that we're developing. Are, are you, is that a few hundred thousands of Yes, yes. So it, depending on people's pockets, that could be quite challenging, I think, to roll out tens or even hundreds or thousands yeah. of those sensors. <laughs> yeah, it's probably a science thing. <laughs> we tend to use units like that. It is just a thousand. <laughs> so we tried to do this in a low-cost way, um, and there's a real motivation to doing so. Um, from an economic point of view, this is a, a map of potential customers in a way, because the blue dots are where we already have manual analysis sites using that sticky tape detector method. Um, so there's clearly a lot of interest around the world in measuring this pollen, but only the red dots have been trialed with automated sensors, so really only a handful. So if we could convert those blue dots into red, um, I think that'd be a really cool thing to do, and genuinely quite a helpful thing, I think, for solving this problem. Um, yeah, well, just to add, as a curiosity, let's say that there is a lot of interesting dynamics to pollen. So there's a lot of seasonality in when the pollen outbreaks actually happen. Um, it absolutely depends, though, on where you are in the world and what source regions you're near. So tree pollen is a very different species to grass pollen, and so they have different cultivation properties and propagation properties. Um, this is just a measurement from Hobart. Um, where they have a quite good pollen monitoring system. Um, and so you can see there's spikes in the number of counts of the pollen at different times of the year. Um, generally at this site you tend to see there's less pollen in July. Um, and then around summer, getting closer to January, you see more of these spikes of outbreaks of pollen. And so it's just highlighting that this is not a simple like uh, thing that you can just put out and measure. You really have to be aware of what types of particles you're, you're trying to target, um, and designing your system such that it can handle quite low number densities of particles, as well as potentially quite high. So again, an interesting engineering problem. Um, so I think, as I've sort of said, we, we intend to try and solve this with our holographic systems. Um, but what we have done is to deploy our, a prototype system um, in the field, um, again at this uh, Tasmanian site in Sandy Bay, Hobart. Um, and we deployed it against the gold standard current method, which is uh, this sticky tape based method um, shown in the background, a, a Burkhard pollen detector. Um, and so I can talk a bit about those results from that comparison. But, but, but first, just again highlighting that pollen is a very complicated thing. So these are size distributions for two different types of pollen. Um, so the red is one type of pollen, and it's got quite a broad size distribution. And the green is a different type of pollen, and it's got much narrower distribution. So with size alone, um, you can try and start to classify types of pollen. But even then, there is definitely challenges. Um, you could imagine a distribution like this red one might be hard to disentangle from this red one. And so it's furthermore quite interesting to use our other observables, which include the shapes of the particles. Um, as well as potentially a sense of their internal structure, because we are capturing that phase information. 
So for pollen particles that are suitably transparent, um, I think the internal structure could be a very useful tool, as long as various other tricks that we're aware of. Um, I think there's definitely a good case to be made that this can be done well. Um, so just, I guess, to finalise, um, this is some of our results from that field study we did with our holographic microscope method, and which is uh, potentially automatable and doesn't need human intervention, with the, uh, the Burkhard uh, manual detection method um, at the same site. So this plot shows the counts of pollen that each instrument measured, uh, the Burkhard instrument in the blue, and the holographic instrument in the red. Um, and so normally they agree reasonably well over the times that we've studied. Um, we still need to more carefully analyze this data set, of course, and we need to, um, well, what we've learned is we have a good agreement with the conventional methods, but we need to significantly boost our sampling volume is the important upgrade that's required to this instrument because pollen can be incredibly low number densities compared to clouds. Um, so it helped us to say that this is a great first start and it also guided us to say where we have to go to next. Um, and so this is, I guess, essentially where we're at at the moment. Um, we know that we need to improve our sampling volume um, and we have a path forward to doing that with a, essentially a larger camera as well as a few other upgrades. Um, we've improved other aspects like the enclosure, so actually letting this thing rotate with the wind is actually a really good idea. Um, so it's a bit of a sleeker design so that you're obstructing less particles. Um, and going forwards, yeah, it's, uh, it's continuing this development, um, seeking funding to more easily do that development. Um, and yeah, I think it's a really exciting project to be working on. So, to conclude, uh, we develop automated uh, and lightweight holographic particle sensors to measure 3D particle properties. Um, we've done field testing in places like Antarctica and the Snowy Mountains to say that these properties are uh, at least agreeing with conventional methods um, and intrinsically uh, valuable in their own right. Um, we've made preliminary uh, preliminary progress to the applications of this work, so calibrating remote sensing methods and in validating climate models. We undertook a world first balloon launch of a holographic system of this kind, um, and we're pursuing the commercialization of sensors like this to do real time monitoring of pollen. Uh, so there's all manner of fun things we could hope to do in the future, largely it's around taking more measurements and upgrading the science. So. <laughs> Point is, if there's anyone who's got an interest in this sort of work, and we're always interested in other applications, so we're keen to uh, talk further with anyone that's interested. So, thank you for listening. That's, uh, that's all. <laughs>